everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Night. I'm Joe. I'm Jeff. And uh, tonight, Jeff, we're going to talk about a subject that's been in, um, well, it's been hard to avoid. It's been in the news a lot. And that's, it's referred to as cancel culture. And we thought it, um, it would be useful to to discuss this, particularly in light of the virtues, uh, as we apply to everything. So, um, but uh, before we begin, uh, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking a Templeton Rye on the rocks. Just simple. It's very nice. Middle shelf sort of rye whiskey. Nice. Discovered it a little while ago. Um, when we had one of our uh, Club Ulysses parties. I I just read something about Templeton rye and a new rye that they have out that's getting good reviews. So I'll have to look for it. Um, so do you have a question you'd like to ask me, Jeff? <laughs> yes, what are you drinking, sir? Oh, funny you should ask that. <laughs> uh, I actually, tonight, am uh, drinking a sidecar. It's a classic kind of uh, cocktail with um, cognac, um, lemon juice, and uh, eat an, an orange liqueur, usually Cointreau, but I'm using a blood orange liqueur, mm -hmm. and a sugared rim and a, uh, an orange twist. Very fancy. Very fancy. Um, quite tasty, too. So here's to you. To your health, sir. So, um, <clears throat> lately, um, people have been, some people, uh, public figures, politicians. People, all these people. Lots of people. Celebrities. Celebrities, particularly. <laughs> no, notable people, whether for renown, usually for infamous behavior, um, have been decrying something they're calling referring to as cancel culture. Uh, the origin of the term had nothing to do with that. As, as far as I can tell, um, the origin of the term was in an article about the renewal or cancellation of TV series. And if a series wasn't, wasn't announced for a renewal early, it was considered to be canceled. And the, the author decried that as a form of cancel culture or cancellation culture. But that's not how it's being used now. It is being used. Uh, now I had no, I had read that it was a that it has been borrowed from hip hop culture. And um, particularly its origins have been unofficially sort of traced to the uh, movie New Jack City. And I think I think what happened is that somebody borrowed a term from someone else and it expanded and it got used in multiple ways. I think it's one of those things that's really difficult to trace the the word origin of there are. Um, it's uh, pretty organic. Yeah, there are word origin philologists who yes. track the origins of words and phrases. I will leave that to them because what I'm because what we're discussing is really the current usage of it or right this use of it. <clears throat> and you had a um, I think a good concise way of explaining how it's being misused. <clears throat> well, the <clears throat> I think there is it's worth looking at this as a genuine concern. I mean, I don't think we should dismiss the, the, the phenomenon out of hand because it is, it is a genuine phenomenon. However, I think we, the, um, those people who, or, or many, particularly politicians, I don't, I don't find it so much as a, a celebrity thing, but politicians are using it now as a way to sort of flip victimhood yeah. and, um, the, saying something that's that's outrageous or offensive and then when they're called on it they 
they say, oh, I, I, look, I'm a victim of cancel. I'm, I'm a victim of cancel culture. Free speech is dead. And ter- be, making themselves into victims of this, this imagined um, uh, crusade to stamp out anything that isn't uh, liberal enough. And it, it, there's a lot to unpack there because we've talked about about courtesy and right. and um, being respectful to other people. Um, we've talked about a true apology versus a faux apology. When <laughs> faux apology, that's good. I like that. Thank you. I <laughs> find that myself. Faux apology. And you see a lot of faux apologies. And oh, sure. somebody does something wrong and then claims to be the victim because they're being called on it. Right. They're it's they aren't they aren't even offering a faux apology. The right. I'm sorry if I'm sorry that you found this offensive isn't right, yeah. faux apologies. I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, yeah, I, it, it, there are lots of faux apologies, but a true apology starts with an acknowledgement. I did something wrong, followed by, I'm sorry, the apology, what's thought of as an apology, but a true apology has four steps. The third step is a promise to never do it again. And the fourth step is making amends. Yes. And when people jump from what they've done to claiming uh, to be a victim of cancel culture, they are not, they're not even offering a faux apology. They're simply trying to to use it for their own notoriety and yeah well however however i want to point out that someone who makes a statement and genuinely feels the way they have stated doesn't owe anyone an apology i mean i just want to point that out they they're not obliged to apologize um if they are speaking their truth if they're speaking their truth, but they can speak their truth in a way that is about them rather than than about of offending other people or minimizing the hurt of other people. And an example is a conversation I had yes. with someone who um, was 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 supporting the name the current name or they've actually dropped it of the washington football team they've dropped the name offensive name um it was offensive to native americans they've dropped that name um and he was taking issue with this he said but they're an iconic team and nobody should be offended and i said you don't you don't get to decide for other people what they find deeply offensive he said but i can i can i'm not deciding for them i just disagree i said well you can disagree that the earth isn't flat and you can disagree that gravity doesn't exist you know like like the roadrunner or wiley coyote (laughs) but it that doesn't you're disagreeing with it doesn't you're disagreeing with the fact that people find it offensive because you don't when you're not a group member of the group who's offended doesn't yeah you can disagree with anything that doesn't make you right just like disagreeing with the earth not being flat well true and you you're there's another there are layers to this though yeah there are Um, i don't want to oversimplify it because it's really it is it is yeah. complicated because I, you know, you, if you're, because there's also the idea that I'm not, res, you know, one is not responsible for how someone else feels only what you do. If however, you, you have been told that this thing is offensive or hurtful or whatever, and you ignore it and continue to do it, you're at fault yes. saying, not apologizing for saying something that you think is the truth. And it's not, yeah, this is not talking, it's the the cancellation or actually accountability for what people say is never about speaking what they think is the truth. It's about 
offering, genuinely offering offense or behaving badly. Those are the, yes. those are the, so it's never about somebody saying, well, this is, this is how I truly feel. And doing so in a way, it's possible to talk about your own feelings and your own thoughts in a way that doesn't intentionally give offense to other people. True. Now, but, now this is also, we're talking about a specific something someone has done and they are immediately called on it. Another aspect that I think people are, are objecting to this so-called cancel culture is the something dragged up from their past as, as offensive and um, insensitive or, you know, what a racist, ableist, sexist, whatever is called up from their past. And that is levied, that is, is levied against them as an accusation of, see, this is the kind of person they are. I, I think that people can grow and change. And if somebody truly offers a full and correctly formatted apology and has grown from what they've done, good heavens, I, you know, there are things I did that um, I uh, would apologize, I would never consider doing now that I did because I didn't know any better um, and actually have at when I realized what I'd done, uh, even years later, sought out, uh, uh, I apologize for it. But it's, that's <clears throat> bad behavior. There's certain kinds of bad behavior that have a statute of limitations and some that, <laughs> and some okay. that don't. I mean, it's a social statute of limitation. True. So, the behavior of somebody, uh, like the behavior that sparked the Me Too movement, the Harvey Weinstein's and the ab abusive, not just sexist, but right. abusive behavior didn't come to light for many years because of that person's um, power in, in their industry, power and influence. And well, and, and to yeah, some extent, to some extent, the, the culture, and again, this is a, I'm not, this is not an excuse, but it's the, the culture surrounding it. It was, it's one of those things where it was, it was known. There's, there was no, it wasn't a, it was only a secret, you know, in that nobody was allowed to talk about it. You know, everybody knew it was happening and, and, and it happened, it it happened in all kinds of businesses. It's, you know, yeah. we know what it is. So, so that it wasn't exactly acceptable, but it was kind of accepted and it was still wrong and everybody knew it was wrong. So you weren't allowed to talk about it, but you also, everybody kind of knew it was happening. And, you know, that's, and that to me just makes it all worse. Yes. And there, there are so many things like that 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 happened that that used to exist that used to occur in society that are no longer acceptable and yes. sometimes the people who complain loudest about what they think cancel culture is are are objecting to the fact that they can't behave in certain ways can't say certain things yes that they really want to, that society has moved on and, the, and it's moved in some ways closer to the virtue of courtesy. At the same time, parts of society move way far away from that. So- <laughs> Well, uh, courtesy and honesty. Yes. Yeah, well, the virtues all work together. If only there were a word for that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, maybe yeah. we'll do a segment on that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think one of the other things are companies like the estate of Dr. Seuss. Yes, um, I was hoping we would talk about that. that. Have they aren't they aren't destroying existing copies? They are pulling from future publication 
certain titles and certain images that that Dr. Seuss himself would have disavowed today, yes. given where he how he grew as as a person. Um, but you know, and that is not Dr. Seuss is being canceled. Nobody's taking away the cat in the hat. Nobody's taking away Bartholomew and the Ublack, which is one of my favorite <laughs> stories because as a child, it introduced me to the impact that a, a limited monochromatic palette with a splash of color can have in a uh, exciting visual way as a uh, part of graphic storytelling. Nobody and cheaper to, and and uh, inexpensive to print. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but nobody's taking that away. Um, well, and in, in light of all of his his huge volume of work in um, uh, ecology and anti-fascism and all of that stuff, I mean, you. I actually had someone before I heard about Dr. Seuss, I had someone in a grocery store say to me, just we're standing in line and you know, you're trying to have conversation through a mask six feet away. And uh, this woman pointed me, well, they're, they're canceling Doc or they're, um, they're banning Dr. Seuss now. And I went, what? Cause I hadn't heard any of this before. Yeah. I'm like, what could they possibly find in Dr. Seuss to ban him? And I had, I haven't seen a copy of uh, it happened on Mulberry Street, obviously, in 40, 50 years. So I had, of course, forgotten. And at the time I encountered it, all of these sort of stereotypical images that are so offensive. It was a he was a cartoonist and um, uh, a satirist and an editorial cartoonist long before he did his books. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, and I'm not excusing it now, certainly, but then it was a visual shorthand. Yes. For people who had limited knowledge of other cultures. Well, and certainly when you think about, you know, he, d he certainly did editorial anti-fascist cartoons during World War II, but when you think of the virulent racism of um uh, you know, that existed at the time it's uh, that was when well when any country goes to war they one of the things they do is intentionally dehumanize the yes. the enemy and that happened and the ways it happened in caricatures now we would consider those caricatures of the Japanese to be racist. Nobody would have said that during during World War II. Nobody would have thought about that because it was an existential struggle. Yeah. And so I I understand that, but it's not something anybody would would do now. We look at uh, World War II propaganda from every side. And say it's terrible, and certainly um, I've seen a lot of it, and and from everybody in the in the culture, uh, in all the participants in the war, that doesn't excuse it. The fact that Dr. Seuss did it, he was a man of his time, but he grew, he yes. changed, um, and so he's not he is not being banned and canceled. So. People are using being canceled and being banned as the same thing. Nobody's banning him. And who would ban him anyway? Who are they? Right. Um, and well, well, according to this woman, it's the Democrats. So this woman in the grocery store. Somehow, because now that the Democrats have a slim, tiny majority, somehow they have, they're able to ex exercise this incredible power in the market to uh, just ban certain things which is yeah, I, then yeah that it's absolutely ridiculous and yeah. the people some of the people who are screaming loudest about being canceled are on television every day you yeah. multiple times a day and on twitter and on 
Facebook and on all kinds of social media, um, those who are still allowed, because social media, the companies that the social media companies are private entities, right? The same people who were who have strongly advocated for a laissez-faire um, kind of capitalism um, <clears throat> don't like it then when those companies for legitimate business reasons take actions that they don't disagree with, that they don't agree with. Well, but you know what, whether it's a <laughs> given, well, this is uh, again, the, the hypocrisy that I always object to in, in anything is that it doesn't, these are the same people that said it doesn't have to be a legitimate business reason. It can be a religious reason. It can be personal preference. It can, this is a freedom that they always ask about, that they, they insist everyone should have. I'm, I should be free to do this because it's my company without any other excuse or reason. And, and that's what's happening. That is, it, there's no, I don't, I don't think it has to be excused because it's a good business move. Well, think- no, no. And, but just the, the society is moving and the audiences for companies, the composition of them and their attitudes have changed. And well, certainly it, and a company that wants to continue to have an, uh, an audience in, in generations can't only appeal to, <clears throat> to older audiences that might not find certain things objectionable. Um, just like we rather um, morbidly referred to the demographics years ago, the demographics of some automakers as the 70 to dead demographic <laughs> because they were yeah. losing market share because only people 70 and older bought their cars and the companies that changed to appeal to a younger audience survived and those that didn't are well, well they survived for a little while until fairly recently yeah yeah but <clears throat> um so I, the, the, one of the things that's so remarkable about what's been happening for the past several years is the absence of shame. Yes. Complete, and people will say and do things, and, and as the distinction between infamy and renown has been lost in the 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 with the goal of fame that doesn't distinguish between infamy and renown. It's not true that increasingly, though, it's not true. I had to correct some people who said, "Well, any publicity is good publicity," and not anymore. Mm-mm. Not for a business, anyway. Um, right. For for individuals or for celebrities, there are people who who may say something that will cause them to get negative, have negative consequences, negative press coverage, apologize for it, move on, and then they're fine. And so well, but, but now we have we have the the sort of worse um, uh, phenomenon where somebody sees something out, something outrageous and suddenly, and and as soon as people call them on it, they get talk show bookings. Yeah. yeah. You know, and again, it's that victim, it's that that taking on the victimhood that oh, I my life has gotten so horrible since all of these people are attacking me now. And I'm going to go on this talk show circuit and tell everyone how miserable I am. Yeah. As right. a way to open up the door to having these people who are attacking me be blamed. And, and I would like that I would trace that back to some of the early, what's seemed to be intentionally leaked sex tapes. 
Oh, sure. That yeah, there's that caused people to become famous or increase their fame while they could then say, em empathize with me, pity me for how terrible things are, how I've been, how I suffer. Um, and it's, I'm not, I'm not saying that that, that that kind of abuse of privacy hasn't occurred because it has, but there are some, um, there are some individuals who there is some evidence that this was a career boost and was intentionally leaked. Well, we've also, we, well, and that's sort of endemic of a, of a culture. It, it's a wrong, it's bad to, to do that. It violates somebody, somebody's privacy. The people who do that should, who leak un, without somebody's permission should suffer consequences for that. Well, I mean, unless it's a new, unless it's journalism, that's what, um, I mean, we've got a history of, you don't, you don't see it so much anymore, but investigative journalism used to be a thing where. But investigative oh, journalists are not paparazzi. No, I think there's absolutely a, true. But is, there, is something legitimately newsworthy? Yes. Yes. When it, when you usually, you are, you are exposing someone, a public figure, investigative journalists classically would be investigating a public figure, an elected official or an, or a, a government appointee of some kind who is doing something nefarious or um, something immoral without anyone paying any attention to it. And then the journalists would shine a light on that so that they're, you know, people who were in the electorate could make decisions based on their, the character of that individual. And that's, that's a different thing, but we have, we are evolved. We are devolving into a culture that puts money ahead of dignity. Right. And that's, I think the, the core of this, I think that's where that is, is that as long as I can make money off of it, I don't care what people think of me. In fact, in fact, I can, I can offset how people look at me because if I'm making money, I'm a good person. That it excuse well, making money excuses yeah. bad behavior. Well, there is, there is a, um, the prosperity gospel. I, I hesitate to call it a theology, but where, um, People say, well, God sh is showing that he approves of you because you have money. Yeah. And, uh, it's all tied uh, together. We're, we're wandering away from cancel culture and yeah. other well, um, problems. Yeah. Bills. Um, but I wanted to bring that up, that I think that that's, yeah. that this is, there's a core problem, I think, and that it is morality is no longer important. It's only whether you are effective at, at gathering, acquiring capital. Well, uh, people, some people view that as its own moral value, the acquisition of wealth. Yeah. Um, and uh, individual morality, and we've talked about the difference between individual morality and social ethics. Yeah. And that ethics are the rules by which people interact in a society. People have, there are, people who have worked to change the fundamentals of society, that hard work and following the rules used to be, uh, whether they ever were or not, for a time they were more likely to give, appro be appropriately rewarded. Um, or at least they were perceived to be. Yes. Um, that no longer seems to be the case. Now, there are the flip side of the the people claiming to be victims of doing say, saying something or doing something wrong and then not apologizing claiming to be a victim of cancel culture when they are not being officially censored by the government so it's not a violation of first amendment free speech rights as is often claimed are the same people who criticized people like um, Colin Kaepernick 
yes. for, uh, and and other people for their very legitimate uh, protests, peaceful protests, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which are protected um, <clears throat> under under the uh, Constitution. Um, and then, but then, and then it gets to the the uh, back it calls back to the well. He's an employee of a private uh, company, and that company should be allowed to fire him for his behavior. Regard, you know, I, I'm I'm just pointing that out again. Yeah, it, There's well, another hypocrisy it, layer there. That's the hypocrisy. Yeah. So I think it is, and and going back again, it was it was legitimate at at some point in history that bad behavior met with social consequences. There was, uh, until, unless and until somebody apologized and made amends for it. Um, and- Genuine contrition. Yeah, and that, that meant a lot. And <clears throat> so, um, when that's being, when that process is not being followed, we end up with people doing something uh, bad or saying something offensive, and then then themselves claiming to be the victim, right? While hypocritically seeking to um, cancel other people. Well, yeah, and the. I, I think it's a, a disingenu disingenuity. Is that a word? Disingenuousness. Of, of let's go with that. Okay. <laughs> of the uh, purposefully saying something to invite an attack, or to in, to invite um, uh, a negative response. You know. Yeah. Um, and then using that to further the cause of their original uh, indiscretion. Um, yeah, and you know, there's some people who have a public platform who right. are are trolls. We would call them on social media. We'd call them trolls. And while it's useful, it's essential to engage in debate and discussion with people whom you disagree with on significant issues, nobody owes a troll anything. Right. And <clears throat> so I will, um, when it's clear that somebody doesn't want a discussion, they're, they're, they are not moved by evidence, they keep changing the goalposts, they engage in all kinds of logical fa fallacies or they're sea lining or, any of those kinds of things, um, I just block them. Yeah, am, am I canceling them? Well, I'm not. I'm not. They can talk to other people. I'm. Right. I'm just. Cho I am choosing not to play pigeon chess. And the term <laughs> pigeon chess, never play pest chess with a pigeon, because it craps all over the board and knocks over all the pieces. And right. so there's there's no point in in it. So. Um, un unfortunately, there are some uh, notable public figures and elected officials who um, are pigeon chess playing. They're pigeon chess grandmasters. <laughs> okay, they're better pigeon, better at playing pigeon chess than pigeons. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> now let's look, so let's while we're talking about politicians, let's talk for a moment about Al Franken. Yes, who I think, who is an actual, I think an actual victim of what we're calling cancel culture now. I think he was made so he was he was so vilified. He he felt he I don't I don't know I don't know how Al Franken felt, but it seems to me that he he felt himself backed into a corner, and the only thing he could do, he he did all the things you talked about. He apologized. He, he made the mistake first of saying it was 20 years ago. It was, you know, it wasn't that big a deal. And she knew about it. That wasn't enough. Um, he ended up having to resign a, a, who was a, a great champion of liberal causes 
including, in, in, including in his office was felt forced to resign because he had violated some principle and the the problem was there was never an investigation right that he was pressured to resign by his colleagues before there was an investigation and some of his colleagues genuinely thought he should some of them i think were engaging in self-aggrandizing self-serving behavior um <clears throat> and this i think is the danger when we talk about cancel culture and and what and we're, we're looking at cancel culture as a as a sort of liberal leftist phenomenon in in well it's certainly being it's certainly being used as an accusation by yes. people who are more on the right right so so in this instance with with al franken i think that is what so i'm, I'm i only want to, to establish that so that i can say that what the right is doing or, or at least what gives the the right ammunition is things like the self-aggrandizing people you're talking about in al franken's case where yeah. i can make i can make a big name for myself with the left if i jump on this accusation bandwagon and i think i think one of the things that's become clear is that there should have been an investigation i think even with um governor cuomo of new york who's yeah. accused of far worse things than making off-color jokes which is essentially what al franken was accused of well it was a it was a specific incidents caught on video of him doing a very it was a, a, a photo um yeah i recall it okay. and it was a series of photos yeah and it was tasteless and it was sexist and it was um not funny it was funny by those stand standards yeah. maybe of those days but not now um <clears throat> to, well, it might have been funny it might have been funny, funny within the crew of people with whom the photo was supposed to be shared or Not even to the 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 woman in the photo who apparently even knew about it and consented at the time but she doesn't now but there can be all kinds of social pressures to do that and that's why i'm saying there should have been an investigation and i think for Governor Cuomo, although his behavior seems far more egregious, there should also be an investigation. Yes. If we're going to hold veritas, truth, as a virtue, then it, it requires fact-finding. It requires truth. And, and, if, and wherever the consequences of that lead, um unfortunately the legal system is adversarial not necessarily always focused on finding the truth but there should be an investigation witnesses interviewed um um under oath um and i'm not i'm not defending the behavior he's been accused of it's horrible but there should be an investigation just like there should have been an there should always be an investigation <clears throat> i do recall some of the it it does seem that um often the democrats who are caught doing something badly will resign and yes. pressured by their colleagues will resign Whereas some of the Republicans who have been caught with prostitutes and done uh, and spent all kinds of money that they weren't supposed to spend and done other things will have a press conference with their wife standing next to them and will say, I'm sorry, I let down the people of my district. I'll do better in the future. Right. And they get cover from their colleagues. Right. And they stay in office, yeah, and and continue to do whatever they have done. Um, corruption exists. Corruption doesn't know 
uh, political affiliation, but there seems to be <clears throat> more cover given to it. The people who are decrying cancel culture have, what they're referring to as cancel culture, have given cover to people who should have legitimately resigned or stepped down or moved on to another career. Yeah. Um, because every vote, every vote from an elected official counts. Not every vote of every citizen, apparently, but every <laughs> vote of an elected official in a legislative body matters. Um, I think we're seeing it more, more and more because many of these in particular, and I, I got to say it from a part of, and, and call me partisan if you want, but um, gerrymandering is an, is an effect there yeah. that the people who are getting away with these things are getting away with them because they're in a protected district. Yes. So they, they can, the you know, voter, they can do these things and they can make a sort of half-hearted apology. And then it doesn't matter if, if they're, <laughs> You know their their supporters will vote for them, and that's all that matters. Yes. And gerrymandering, named after El, Elbridge Gerry, it should be called yeah, yeah. gerrymandering, but it's yes. gerrymandering, um, is horrible because it lets the politicians choose their voters instead of the voters choosing their elected officials, and <clears throat> the the imbalance, the misrepresentation of the people is uh is has gotten to awful proportions and despite the supreme court saying well we don't have any way to measure the effect there have been academic models academics who've created models statisticians statisticians who've created models that can clearly define the unfairness that is the right. access vote or the uh, the the minimized vote in districts, um, <clears throat> so, but right. again, you know. Um, so yeah. anyway, and you know, that and the electoral college and the, the imbalance of electoral votes and all that stuff, you know, we can, that, that's probably too political for our, our purposes here, but. We well, for up, this episode, but we might do, do another one. That's, well, we end up getting dragged to it more and more because because both of us see this incredible moral gap opening between politicians and their constituents. Yeah. So, you know, we end up going there as often as not just because we're, we're so mortified by the whole situation, but. Well, and, and when you look at the popular opinion on several issues um, <clears throat> goes overwhelmingly in one direction for on certain issues but that legislation agreeing with that can't be passed because the constituents of the people elected from gerrymandered districts are not the they're not those elected officials constituents their donors are right and so that's a the, the money is the source of a lot of the problems too yeah um, so um, as in so many things yes but to bring it back around to this this notion of cancel culture i i think that there should be accountability for people um <clears throat> as i have said before if you don't call people on their shit they have no motive to change. So right. people should be, and I expect that for me, if I do something wrong, I expect people to, my friends particularly to say, hey, I, you know, this was, I don't think this was right. I think this is wrong. I think you did something wrong. I think you should uh, consider it. You should apologize, so on. I, uh, that's one of the things we do for each other. Right. <clears throat> that is not to use uh, a phrase from our um, SCA experience, not questioning someone's honor. It's helping to safeguard their honor. Now, and now here's another thing, though. Um, 
that I'll bring up and I, the devil doesn't need an advocate, I know, but the, as you said, an investigation is necessary. Yes. And I believe an investigation is always necessary before drawing any conclusion. Now, we, and this is uh, not an outgrowth, but uh, it actually predates by a little bit. The Me Too movement is counter to that in some ways. Now, statistically, I understand all the numbers and that I, and I am certainly based on those statistics, I am certainly inclined to believe a woman who says she has been harassed, assaulted, abused, whatever, because I, I absolutely believe the vast majority of the claims are true. And a lot of times there's no evidence. There a lot can't, of times there is no evidence. There can't be evidence because the abusers are so good at hiding it. However, that opens up J'accuse. You know, it, it, we, yeah. we, um, <clears throat> when there is, and, and just to be clear, that was from um, <clears throat> the French Revolution. Well, no, it was in the Dreyfus case when, when the lawyer for Dreyfus, who was um, a Jewish officer in the French army, was unjustly accused his lawyer turned around and accused the the state and the military tribunal and that was jacques well it but it predated that and the jacques was used during the french revolution to, okay. to point out someone and say oh i accuse you of being yeah, i accuse you and you know they you know yeah. because well, it was it was as so, it was bad enough to be acute to be to be suspected of being and and that was that was the McCarthy era. Yes, absolutely. So the 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 challenge, and this is in the purview of people who are trained investigators in in this area and can evaluate the credibility of witnesses. <clears throat> Somebody, one of the things that's happening is trial in the court of public opinion or in the media rather than um, in a, an actual investigative process. An actual investigative process can interview witnesses when they're, and create a preponderance of evidence to say, you know, you're saying this happened at this time. I would, and they can, a person can be verified to be at a certain place at a certain time with another person. And that can happen again and again and again doesn't mean there have to be eyewitnesses doesn't mean there has to be videotape or re, or audio recordings right. or photos photographic evidence there can be a lot of um pointers at this that and that can verify what has occurred um <clears throat> uh, contemporaneous corroboration of stuff and a lot of that existed in in the the people who were um, uh, who started the Me Too movement, and there was just tons of that. And that yeah. Me Too movement, I think, actually started around Harvey Weinstein, the producer. And the the evidence was <clears throat> was contemporaneous accounts, multiple multiple people. And as you say, it was it was not a secret. Um, right. So very well understood. Um, <clears throat> so the, yeah, just an accusation shouldn't be enough, but, and, and as you said, you understand the numbers and the, the, and I, and I certainly recognize the, the uh, existence of the systemic Yes, problems that support this kind of abuse. I, I, and the, and the low, extremely low, um, occurrence of fictitious accusations. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> and yet, our justice, our our judicial system is based on the, the the uh, assumption of innocence before unless proven guilty, and that that philosophy is based on better 
a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man be unjustly convicted. That is the philosophy. Um, and I agree with that, but we're not talking about necessarily legal action. Again, no. it can be, you know, if, if, if an executive at a company has multiple accusers who come forward and make sworn statements under oath about conduct, yes. the company can decide to let that person go um, before there's ever a, a criminal trial, a civil suit, the company can let them go. Are they being canceled? Are they being, well, that's a no, like you said, consequence, consequences, consequences. Yeah. And I also, I, I also want to be clear in that um, the, like I said, the systemic problems surrounding it and that multiple accusers and all of that, that's all absolutely important. And this, this isn't a, a court of law. Where, where these decisions can be made as to whether or not this person is like, it, in, in the case you're talking about, it doesn't even matter whether the person is actually guilty, the perception, the, the perception of their guilt in the, in the case of a, a representative of a company, the, the overshadowing of that person's character is sufficient for a company to let them go if they are representing that company. So that's, that is absolutely sensible. So, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I think that this is a, a parallel to the cancel culture thing where, um, yes, accusations are, are important and, and the, the vast majority of them are, are probably true. We, you, there's no way to prove that they are or not. That's kind of the, the problem. But if, if, if an individual has 30 accusers lined up to say, yep, happened to me. Yep, and, and, and it happened exactly the same way. And the, this person went through these steps every single time. They are, it should be clear to anyone with common sense that this person is a practiced and repetitive abuser. Um, and I don't need a court of law to make me think that person doesn't deserve my respect. Yes. And I had to work with the negatives there. Doesn't deserve your respect. Exactly. The, the, um, <clears throat> people should not have to directly confront their abusers because that is, some people are able to, but not everybody is because of the trauma of the abuse. So there needs to be a mechanism by which they can um, make their complaints without having to directly confront their accuser. One of the principles of the legal system is that people have a right to confront their accusers. Yeah. So there are, and, and I am not, in any way uh, claiming to be an, uh, knowledgeable, certainly not an expert in this area of, of law and how those kinds of sensitive issues are handled. Um, a lot of times when um, the legal system has not adequately addressed abuse, people will turn to the press or to other or to legal advocates who turn to the press in order to build a um, public sentiment against the abuser so that at least they will suffer the consequences of um, dismissal by their company um, and possibly other consequences and maybe even embarrass the legal system into taking some action. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, but is that person being canceled? They're facing consequences for their actions. Cancel 
culture is, as we said, <clears throat> Dr. Seuss is not being canceled. Right. Pepe Le Pew was, you know, there's debate about whether his obnoxious, stinky self <laughs> was, whether being a skunk was the visual metaphor for him being a stinker as a person, um, <clears throat> whether he was a caricature, a post-World War II caricature of the Maurice Chevalier. Right. Um, he had the accent. <laughs> yeah. And, um, <clears throat> now, which is that? Now, I, I, Pepe Le Pew, like, well, we're talking about Pepe Le Pew because that came up recently to me too, that I thought those cartoons were were humorous, but it was. But I looking at looking back at them now, the 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 abject terror of the cat, yeah, is what is what stands out to me now. Yeah, um, it was one thing, you know, if if it had been a if it had just been an, an exasperation or a yeah, it's it's looking back at it now. I I look at it with a different viewpoint, and I see the problems with it. At the time, as a as a kid, really, I mean, you saw this uh, the cat the the cat just wanted to get away from this from a skunk who was professing his undying love and attraction, and the cat just wanted nothing to do with him because he's a skunk and not a cat to me there was the, the 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 skunk is kind of blind and stupid because he doesn't realize that the cat isn't a skunk isn't a girl skunk well because she you know walks under paint and gets a right. strike yeah, exactly so he's he's seeing her as a skunk and something attractive right but he's wrong. He's all wrong. And she's, to me, as a child, that was the dichotomy is that he, he's misunderstanding the situation and she's not, but now I see, look back, she's not standing up and maintaining her position in the situation. She's yeah, just trying she, to escape. Yeah. And she's, as you said, genuinely terrified. And yeah. that's kind of horrific. It, it is. It is. And I, but right. it's only through the last you know several decades of, of life and understanding my God, when i first saw the cartoons i never had a relationship with a woman <laughs> <laughs> and having to pick up on those cues and those nuances wasn't a thing now that i have now i see it now it makes it now i am i'm absolutely appalled by it yeah yeah and again it's not it's not someone external, not a they banning him. It's Warner Brothers who owns the rights saying, yeah, this doesn't work anymore. We're not doing this. If you look at some of the early cartoons, there are some horribly racist imagery oh, in early oh my cartoons God, yeah. that, yeah, that, um, you know, there's, there's, as much as I uh, like the Marx Brothers, yeah, there's a couple of uh, scenes in a couple of movies that are, are not good. Um, and oftentimes when the Marx Brothers movies are shown, like on television, those scenes are just removed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of Marx Brothers that can really be removed without really <laughs> without interrupting the continuity well, of the story <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't heavily story driven you know there was always a they're helping somebody to overcome something with the at the races at the opera at the you know or, or uh, they're just trying to get away with something yeah exactly <laughs> um um yeah so again it's the the world has changed at least some to some degree and in some places 
and companies find that their audiences have changed and um, and by audiences, I don't mean just audiences for entertainment. I mean their their target audiences, their consumers, their potential customers have changed, and companies have to keep up with that. Um, well, yeah, and I mean you can't anybody with a little common sense and some knowledge of history, I guess, would recognize that an 18th century person does not have the same did not have the same generally, I mean, I'm making sweeping generalizations here, but an 18th century person did not have the same mindset as a 17th century person or a, or a 16th century person. And a 19th century person had a different mindset from all of them. The 20th century and the 21st century are no different. Yeah. We, we, we learn more, we figure out things, we, we take into account pre, knowledge that we did not previously have. I think one of the challenges is, and it's one I still wrestle with, is separating the art from the artist. Because ah. there's some magnificent um, creative work in all kinds of media by people who are really horrible. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that's that's always a, a challenge to think about about that. Um, um, Picasso was a real shit, as a, <laughs> yes. But I wouldn't want his work removed from museums. The content of the work um, doesn't isn't necessarily objectionable. Certainly, there's some, the content of some creative work doesn't need to be on display anymore. So, but, and so another, another example of um, claiming that something's being a part of cancel culture is the removal of Confederate statues. Yeah. Venerating Confederate generals or war heroes not because it's somehow erasing history which is complete bullshit since a, a wide number a vast number of these statues were put up by i think the daughters of the south yes um in the 50s and 60s yeah and they were put up to reinforce the idea of white supremacy so that's the history that they're arguing in 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 favor of keeping, um, and they're not. But they're not engaging in an honest discussion. They're simply claiming, "See, you're canceling us. You're canceling our heritage. You're canceling history." They're claiming to be a victim. They're not honestly engaging in a discussion of the real issues. Now, but see, and I will point out the sort of to me the the better argument in this case the the statues are are, are a problem and i i don't disagree with the removal of them the, of the confederate statues i'm not sure i'd want a statue of of uh grant or sherman either when it comes right down to it um but mark twain Let's we can talk about Mark Twain as a as an early victim sort of of cancel culture, who I think who's who was removed from libraries and um, things like that. Huckleberry the Finn. Harry of Anne Frank was removed from libraries, and Fahrenheit four fifty one was removed from libraries, and yeah. um, there are lots of books that have been censored. Uh, removed from libraries, uh, libraries canceled, if you will. Um, and some of the people who are decrying cancel culture as a way of becoming the claiming their own being a victim right. when, when they're not, um, are the same people who would advocate for removing books. Yes. From libraries. Yes. Well, and that's my point is that with Mark Twain in particular, 
the 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 um, ostensible reason was because of the stereotypical um, presentation of blacks in that book. However, that's an that is a shallow understanding of what the story, what the Henry Huckleberry Finn was about. Oh yeah, more nuanced reading. Yeah, I mean, presuming the people who are objecting to it have actually ever read. Well, there's that. Read a book. Um, it's much more nuanced than that, and it's about a man, uh, Jim, who's mm -hmm. a man, and under very trying circumstances, very difficult, horrible circumstances, and develops a friendship with uh, Huck Finn. And, well, and in many ways, the book satirizes the South and its relationships yeah. Yeah. Uh, of whites and blacks. And, and it's, <laughs> it's very subtle. Like you say, it's very nuanced because I think it needed to be to get published at the time. But, but it's, it's extremely, I mean, it's, I think it's a valuable to, to have that ever be lost, I think would be a huge and loss to culture. The, it needs it needs discussion it can spark discussion if it's honest discussion and well and like i said there's been so many books that have been banned or removed and i recall when i was in junior high school i wanted to read there were things on the shelves um and i wanted to read the big great adventure stories uh you know the three musketeers and twenty thousand leagues under the sea and all the all of those kinds of big adventures <clears throat> and the librarian refused and I, I went home and i told my folks about this my mother <laughs> came into school told the librarian in front of me to her face he can read whatever he wants to. If he doesn't understand something, we will discuss it with him. You are not to limit anything he can read or he is allowed to read, period. And she turned around and walked away. <laughs> I think, you know, I wish I had met your mother. <laughs> oh, you would have, you would have liked her. Yeah, you would have, you would have, you would have liked her. She was, um, she was the one who um, taught me about, um, weaponized courtesy yeah yes yes as we've mentioned before yep. um well we are we're over our time um this has been yeah. a very good subject i think so and you know it's I, I just want to be clear we are not in any way denying that thing bad things happen to good people no certainly not and what we are saying is when people are using circum they're turning circuit they do bad they're doing bad things and then claiming to be the victim because people are trying to hold them accountable that's a problem <clears throat> so yeah i i yes that and and you are correct i'm not i'm certainly for purposes of per, for purposes of discussion, I'm bringing up points, yeah, that are being made by all, all all the whole spectrum, or I'm trying to at any rate in my faulty way, but um, certainly we are always as as chivalrous people we are we are always advocating protecting those who cannot protect themselves, and speaking truth to power and seeking justice in every situation. That is what is important. Yep. And sometimes to do that, you have to examine things in a not favorable light. You have to question what you believe to, to be sure it's the truth. You know, if you, you can believe something, you have to examine it. You've got to You've got to discuss it with people whose opinions you respect so that you can either reinforce what you believe or abandon it as unworkable. 
and grow. Yeah. And learn. So, so that's what we're that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to open up discussions for people. And please comment, let us know where you think we went wrong. Um, like, share, tell everybody, hey, these guys have got a great idea, or you should get a load of these idiots, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whichever, it all works for us. <laughs> so, um, all right, then, I think, I think we've uh, covered that. So, well, we've, we've certainly taken up an hour. <laughs> <laughs> We well, this is not an exhaustive uh, examination of anything. We never claim it is, but uh, but it was worth worth doing. I think. Yeah, I think so. So, um, all right then. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, Always a pleasure. Yep, yeah, as Jeff said, like and share and subscribe, and uh, until we see you next time, be thou a good night and true.